First of all, everyone, thank you. Welcome so much for coming. Um, we're going to talk about what I call the art of problem solving. And the reason I call it the art of problem solving is because I believe problem solving is really an art. It's something that some people are born with a little bit of ability to do. But like any other art, it takes a little bit of refinement. You have to practice that skill, you have to refine your skills, and you improve on your abilities. But it really is a bit of an art. Some people are just good at it, and some people are just, they're not good at it. They don't want to do it, they don't like it, and they shouldn't really do it. But it is a bit of an art. Uh, one thing I noticed is that some people are very interested in problems. They like to solve problems, they like logic, they like understanding how things work. And I realized this when I was walking around my grandmother's house and she had crossword puzzles everywhere. She would buy books of crossword puzzles and she would always be just keeping her mind busy solving crossword puzzles. And as a, as a young lad, I realized that eh, that's not very fun, but I've grown to understand that she was just keeping her mind busy and solving problems because she enjoyed it. It was interesting and entertaining to her. So I think of problem solving is, is really a bit of an art. So again, problem solving is an art. It's a learned skill, and it's a skill that some people don't have, and it's something that we all do that some people just don't like. Programmers and business people face a lot of problems, and some, some people address these problems differently, and we all think about problems a little bit differently. And because we've all thought about problems and had to deal with problems, there's been some, a lot of research done on how problem solving is done. There's been some processes developed. Some people have taken the time to write down and document processes for problem solving. And if you go on the internet and you start researching problem solving, you'll find that there's some, some great graphs and things about problem solving. And a lot of them end up saying things like identify the problem and evaluate your potential solutions and then implement that solution. It's all very business-like and dry and boring and honestly just not that interesting. I realize that I don't have any sort of formal process when I solve problems. I don't follow some magic workflow and I don't have a formula. I just know how I want to get started in doing it. And I, the reason I know is because I've done it enough to have developed a bit of a process in my head, a metho methodology, but I don't have it written down and it's not something I can just magically share with you and you'll magically get all your problems solved. But I did some research and I found someone who has a bit of a methodology for problem solving. It's not a process, it's not, you know, step one, two, three, problem solved, but there are some good tips that you can do to solve problems efficiently and effectively. The person I found who did this is a guy who has a TV show, and it is Adam Savage from the show Mythbusters. If you watch Mythbusters, you'll know that it's kind of a sciencey show and a geeky show, and I look at it and I actually think it's a problem show. It's about people solving problems. Sometimes they have to create the problem and then solve it, but they solve interesting problems. And Adam is particularly outspoken on this topic, and he wrote a talk called Problem Solving. And he talks about how he solves problems and how he thinks about problems. And the reason he does this is because methodology is important. It's important that we don't get things out of order. If we get things out of order, we end up going down a road that causes us to have to do the same things over or rework things that we've thought we solved but we didn't have quite right and that's expensive and it's time consuming and we should try to avoid it as much as possible. So I watched Adam's talk and I did some other research and I found some really interesting things about problem solving and that's what I'm going to share with you. This is what I would call the top hit CD for problem solving. It's some, some basic tips and ideas on how to solve problems and do it in an effective and an efficient way. So the first step is identify the problem. Now, I think everyone could have thought of this answer immediately if I asked you, what's the first thing you should do when you solve problems? The problem with us understanding that as the most basic step is, it's, it's too easy of, of an answer. We've all, we all know that and we all think that that's the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do, but we don't ever invest any thought into the depth of doing this exact step. We just think that we've identified the problem real fast and move on. No identify the problem, and identify it properly. It's really easy to confuse problems and solutions. Sometimes clients come to us with solutions and not problems. Raphael uh, spoke yesterday or the day before and said something about clients coming and saying, add the button. That's a solution, 
why are we adding the button? What's the reason that we're adding the button? What is the button going to do? There's a problem that's being solved behind the button. That's the actual problem. So we have to make sure that we understand the actual problem. I was working on a project and I was asked to look at a statement of work. And the statement of work that I read through was pages long, it was like 40 pages, and it had tons of great detail, like detail that most developers never get and we have to like suck out of our clients, right? And it was really, really informative. And I finished reading, maybe not all 40 pages, but I read a, a bit of it, and I realized that I still had no idea what I was building. I didn't know. I read things about users, and I read things about APIs and integrations, but it was missing a really important part of the equation, which was, you're going to build an application that does X. No one bothered to actually explain what I was building. They just assumed that I knew or that I could figure it out based on all these details. All the details were in the way. No one bothered to say, hey, Chad, you're actually going to build a website that people can bid on and buy stuff, and it's an auction site. Very, very simple statement of a problem, but they just kind of skipped over it and thought that the d details were, were more important. And once I understood the actual problem, I understood how the details applied to that problem, and it was a lot easier for me to look at that project. Another thing that happens when we have problems is we have a difference between data and information. So I've, I've kind of copped up here some basic numbers. And we can look at this and we can see that there's a difference here. The first top portion is data. It's a bunch of numbers. And if you didn't have the, the money sign and, and then you just had this in a database, you wouldn't really know what those numbers, but those numbers meant. That could be uh, hits on your website. It could be um, sales. It could be uh, costs. It could be a lot of different things relevant to your business. Uh, when we know what kind of data it is, we know that it's sales, then we're able to start creating uh, a bit of a picture and we're able to start understanding that it looks like over time sales are starting to decrease. That's data versus information. What ends up happening though is sometimes we don't know all of the data that's here. So let's think about what could happen if we had this data and this information and we actually added some more information to it or added some more data to it. Let's say, for example, that the February and March dates are February, February and March from 2012, and that the January date is actually January 2015. Sales actually aren't decreasing, they're actually going up, but we don't have that based on this picture. So we have to understand all of the data and make sure that we're pulling out the proper conclusion based on that. The big idea, right? Uh, big idea, this speaks to the notion of understanding everything that's going on. Back to the, uh, the, the statement of work that I looked at. I was given this statement of work, had lots of details. I didn't know what was going on. When we're doing something like building an application, we have to make sure that we understand the big idea, that we know all the things that we're going to be connecting to, all the things that we're going to have to be plugging into, and we have to understand where our scope in the problem starts and where it ends. And when someone else's scope in the problem picks up, what do we have to make sure that we've given them so that they can do their part of the job? There's a, a principle called Occam's Razor, and I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly. Occam's Razor uh, is a, a theory, uh, and of, he's a philosopher, and he stated that when we're doing something like problem solving, we should always select theories that have the fewest assumptions. The reason that we do that is because we want accurate models for whatever it is that we're going to be doing. By reducing the number of theoretical assumptions that we make, we get a more accurate model. Well, we can do this as programmers by going and asking more questions. We might start out with a pretty you know, vague idea of the problem we're trying to solve, but by doing some sort of discovery phase or going to the client and asking more questions, we're able to reduce the number of assumptions that we make and increase the accuracy of the model that we end up with. So understand your big idea, understand your details. There is a scope and a depth to the entire equation. So Joomla, we have these things, these, these systems. And in Joomla, we have, or in, in the system stack, we end up with 
we'll have uh, you know, a web server, a database engine, PHP. This is all basic stuff. When a client calls us and says, hey, my website's broken, I need you to debug it and fix it, where do we start? There's a lot of things that could be wrong with all of these systems. It could be something really basic. It could be not even related to our server. It could be DNS is broken somewhere else. So how do we start trying to break this problem, this vague problem of my white screen on my site? I have a kind of a simple process that I follow, and the process allows me to get the most information in the fewest number of steps. So the first thing that I would do is I would connect to the server via FTP or SSH or something. That tells me, hey, the server's up or it's not. The thing I do after that is I create a simple HTML file, hello world, can I hit this file? That's going to answer a bunch of key questions. DNS, up or down. Server, up or down. Web engine, up or down. All of those questions answered one file. That's a lot of information with one maneuver. Now, I could add uh, a little thing to this, which might actually uh, save me one more step, and that is maybe a PHP info file. A PHP info file answers all those questions plus is PHP running, and is the web server configured to use PHP? Another two really crucial bits of information. At that point, I'm going to start thinking about, OK, is the database there or not? And then I can start going into Joomla and debugging the Joomla system and figuring out which module broke on an update that George pushed out without testing something properly. <laughs> uh, but this is really key. And the key here is understand how all these systems work, understand how all these systems play with each other, spend a little bit of time in, in learning about the configuration of what your system is running on, because then you're able to start making really fast decisions in your debugging process. You can skip all the basics or make sure that you've covered the basics and then move on to the more advanced debugging and digging into a lot more detail. This is important in problem solving. Understand all the systems that you're working with, all the tools that you have running. Business application. So I think that problem solving is a business problem as well as a programming problem. There ends up being in, in programming two different types of logic that we end up dealing with. The first type of logic we end up dealing with is abstract. This is things like libraries. As developers, we think in abstracts. We want to make sure that we build something to be reusable, so we try to abstract it out as much as possible. But then we actually have to come back and use those libraries, and we do literal logic. We do application logic. Application logic is business logic, and businesses have solved that logic problem, hopefully, already. Business rules come as a result of solving problems that the business has. So here's an example. I was working on an e-commerce project, and I was told that we were going to have two different shipping companies involved in the shipping of the products. I said, well, why is that? This is a business rule case, but why do we have two different shippers? What's going on here? And the person I was working with said, well, we've discovered that in the United States, it's cheapest for us to use UPS as our shipping company. But it's expensive to use them internationally. So internationally, we actually use USPS instead. Kind of surprising. United States Postal Service is cheaper outside the US. I don't know. Uh, so I was like, all right, no problem. That's two business cases that I can deal with, not too difficult. I said, well, hang on, uh, not, quite, not quite done yet, actually. So the continental United States, which is the 48 states and not Alaska or Hawaii, we want to use UPS. But for those other two states, go ahead and use U USPS there uh, as well. I'm like, all right. Not quite as easy. I can't just do a country selection, but I can do country plus state and figure that out. Not too bad a complication. Oh, but we're not done. We actually have one more thing we're going to add. Um, we want you to use, for USPS, their airmail rate. OK? But we don't want you to call it airmail, because customers will think that's too expensive. So pull the airmail rate, but actually call it flat rate. All right. The business had determined that it was easiest for their users to not complicate them and make them think that they're paying more for an expensive rate of shipping by calling it air mail, even though it's got to be air unless they're shipping it as cargo, right? Uh, but they had figured out that 
the users were confused and, and they didn't, didn't want to deal with this airmail thing because they would get calls. Why are they you know, sending it like this? So they just decided to cut out the confusion, call it something really simple, and the user was happy. So that's what they ended up doing. That's a business case problem for problem solving, which I ended up having to inherit as a programmer and take that and build it out as an application. In businesses, though, we end up with other kinds of things that end up determining the problems that we have. Something like a learning curve. I realize this is not a curve, but I couldn't figure out a good graph or a curve for this. A learning curve is the idea that as we're learning something new, it's going to take us a little bit longer and it's going to be a little bit less efficient for us to do something the first and second time. But as we continue to do it, we'll get more efficient and proficient at it. And eventually, over time, we develop muscle memory. And with muscle memory, we're able to start completing tasks in fewer, fewer bits of time until we've become as optimal as possible completing that task. That's pretty simple, basic business rule stuff. Send someone to get training, they get really efficient at it, great. What no one really ever talks about, though, is this thing called relearning. I call it the relearning curve. I kind of coined this, I think. The relearning curve is a, a very similar curve, but it involves a second step. Relearning is harder, because relearning deals with the neuroplasticity of our brains. We end up understanding a process, and we have that process ingrained in how we think and how we do things. And then changing that process is much harder than it is to learn a process without having something already there. It takes longer. Our brains have to calculate, I have a process, but now I have a new process, replace the old process with a new process. That takes much longer for our brains to comprehend. So I have a story about this. I was hired to do some photography for a company. And so we shot a bunch of photos, my coworker and I, and we had to then crop all these photos and, and you know, make them look nice and everything in Photoshop. So we had shot the photos and I'd start going through doing cropping. Well, I learned Photoshop at the time, had learned it fairly recently. And so I knew that it had a nice handy crop feature and an auto lighten and everything. So I was flying along doing all this work. And I looked over at my coworker and I realized that they were doing this funky stuff with Photoshop that I hadn't seen before. And I said, hey, why don't I show you my process because it's faster than the one that you're doing. And he said, Chad, I learned this process before Photoshop had those features. I know how this process works. And we have to get this job done in a certain amount of time. And it will take me longer to understand the new way of doing it rather than for me to just continue doing it the way I'm already doing it and just get this job done. We're only going to do it once. It's not worth it for me to understand this new process, take more time, possibly miss a deadline. Just let me finish doing what I'm doing here. This is true in business. This is what happens. We end up with a process. We have to calculate the difference between implementing a new process or just continuing to do what we do because it, it's going to cost less. It's going to take less time. It's really important to understand in a problem-solving environment when you, whether or not you should do something like a new process for keeping the same thing that you already have especially if it doesn't pay off. The next thing that we should do in problem solving is talk to experts, like having Robert come over and work on my computer when I knew he could do it much faster than I could. So I have an interesting story about this too. I think it's important to meet experts, and I think that events like J and Beyond allow us to meet experts. We're able to talk to each other, we're able to communicate, able to share ideas. A few years ago, I met a really cool guy. His name is Yise. Does anyone know Yise? From Yurio? Yes. Great guy. I was able to meet him and talk to him and understand a little bit about his business and what he does. After meeting Yise, I went home and I ended up working on a project. And this project, I ended up using Magento, and I know that Yise is good at Magento. And I ended up having some major issues with performance on this site. And I needed to figure out how to solve this. And I spent a lot of time myself digging into the problem and trying to debug it and everything. And at the end of the day, I realized that I just didn't have the skill set of an expert in this area, and I needed help. So I emailed Issei, and I said, could you please tell me how you would do this? What would you do here? How do you fix this type of issue? And he very generously got on a Skype call with me. And over the process of an hour, walked me through a bunch of really important things that I didn't know and told me how I could work on this problem. 
is very, very helpful. And that's why events like Jam Beyond are very, very useful and we should all continue to come to them. It's where we network. It's where we meet other people and where we share information with our friends and our coworkers. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that you should just come to Jam Beyond so that you can find an expert and get free advice, right? We should always make sure that we're compensating our experts, buy them a beer when we see them, make sure that we're friendly to them and that we don't just pull them aside and, and be disruptive and rude. That's not the way that we should deal with other people. But this is a great opportunity for us to get some really great advice and information from people that we don't normally otherwise have access to. So the next thing that we need to do with problem solving is we need to break problems apart. We need to make them smaller. Big problems like big applications or big sites that we have to build and things like that, it's very confusing and there's a lot of things going on and there's moving parts and pieces and it's it's hard to think about all that stuff all at once our brains can't handle that much it's overloading so we have to break problems down and we have to make them smaller and easier to understand this is like modularizing right in Joomla we do this in development we do this we make small little parts and pieces we break things down into smaller chunks so that we can get our heads around them so we have to do this in problem solving. Take these big problems, make them smaller, make them more easy to understand, solve them in little tiny packets one at a time until we've got the entire problem solved. That's how we take on these big, huge problems. If you're a project manager, you should do things like phase out the project. Do phase one, understand the scope of phase one, do that entire thing beginning to end, and then start the next phase. Understanding what you learned from the last one, improve on the things that didn't work, understand how you can make the process more efficient, and then do the next thing. So again, a story. I was reading that really large statement of work and all this complex stuff. Where do I start? Where do I end? What are all the major and minor points of the project? I had a lot of questions to ask. How do things like bidding work? How do the users work? I was told that users were going to be part of an API and that I would be connecting to this API for users. Okay. Do I have to build an interface for them to manage their user data? Yeah, so I need to then know what part of the data I'm going to manipulate, what part I'm not. I need to understand scope, scope of the problem, scope of where my problem interfaces with another problem, things like that. So this is important in problem solving, understanding how things connect to each other. The last thing that I have here is one of my favorite techniques. It's brainstorming. I love this technique. I don't do it quite like that. But I'm really, really uh, consistently doing something like this. I pull up a chair. I grab a coworker when he's not busy. And I sit down and I say, I need to borrow your brain. So I need to borrow your brain. I say this four or five times a day. And he comes over, he sits down, OK. And he'll actually say, how much bandwidth do you need, right? Like, how much do I have to think about your problem? Raphael talked about this as uh, rubber ducking, actually. I think brainstorming is a little bit more technical and nice sounding. But if you want to do rubber ducking, it's fine. But I'll sit and I'll explain my problem to another person. And then two things will happen. One, I'm restating this problem, and I'm having to articulate it in a way that is clear for them to understand. In doing that, I increase my own understanding of the problem, right? Because I'm having to, what's the best way to say this, or how do I explain this problem to them so that they get it? I see whether or not they're comprehending what I'm saying. Do they have a quizzical look on their face? Are they questioning what I'm saying? Are they getting it? If they're understanding it, then I know that I understand the problem. And then the second thing that happens is I get their feedback. Did I explain the problem clearly, yes or no? Did I miss anything in the problem? Do they have any questions that I didn't think of? Then I can start going through potential solutions. If I had the time to think about some possible solutions, for what it was I was going to do, then I can run them by this person and they can say, well, that, that makes sense, or what about this? It's a really great way for me to solve a problem. And I love doing this. Again, this is my favorite technique. I do it all the time. The rubber ducking, probably also just as efficient, but I, I really like talking to someone else and being able to get that interaction. It's really useful. So. This is the point where I don't know if there's any questions or not. But if there are any questions, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll try to ask it, uh, answer it. OK. 
I guess that answers it. Uh, also, don't forget that alcohol is always a solution.